All right. Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone, wherever you are. Um, my name is Denis Jabodon. It's a pleasure to welcome you on this uh, second or third edition of uh, the worldwide um, neurodevelopmental events. Um, I hope you're doing fine and that things are moving forward the way you, you like today. So today, um, our guest is uh, Bassem, As Bassem Hassan from the Paris Brain Institute, um, Institut du Cerveau. Uh, in, in French. Uh, and before I introduce Passem, I'd like to remind you a few things about the way this uh, seminar series is organized for those of you who haven't uh, participated before. So you will see, as well, there's this sidebar on the right where you can make comments, any type of uh, constructive comments that you feel like. And also there's this uh, bar at the bottom, this tab, where you can ask a question. So as, uh, as the presentation moves forward, feel free to ask questions. I'll copy paste them um, uh, if necessary or comment them. And they'll be ranked based on um, the type of um, votes. You can vote on the questions that you would have asked um, yourself. So feel free to, to do that. It's meant to be as interactive as, as possible. Um, <clears throat> also, I'd like to draw your attention on the fact that there's a new seminar series uh, on neurodevelopmental disorders that will take place um, on Tuesdays uh, at 5 p.m. They're put together by Gaia Navarino, Laura Canceda, and Camila Bellone. Um, so yes, if you're interested in development, I guess it, 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 it's a nice uh, sister series and, and do have a look at, at uh, the excellent array of speakers. Um, voila. Um, so, uh, I'd like, I now like to, to introduce uh, Bassem before his presentation. So Bassem grew up uh, in, in Germany and in, uh, in Lebanon, after which he did his PhD and postdoctoral uh, training at Bader College of, of Medicine in USA um, and um, focused on, uh, on um, genetic tools to identify uh, different types of circuits in the fly um, brain. So he actually discovered the dorsal cluster neurons. I didn't know about them, but uh, it's, it is an anatomical entity, uh, which, which are in the optic lobe of the drosophila, and which are interesting because at the, at the larval stage, these neurons will extend or not uh, an axon to the opposite side of the brain. And, um, and uh, uh, Bassem characterized in particular one, some of the molecular mechanisms that control this and made the interesting observation that while some neurons did project, others did not, which I uh, suppose fueled his long lasting interest in trying to understand how deterministic development of neuronal systems are. Um, after um, this uh, training uh, and early career in the US, he, joined, he moved to Belgium to the VIB in Leuven in 2001, where he stayed until 2016 uh, before uh, joining the Paris Brain Institute, by then uh, Institut Cerveau Moelle Epinière, uh, where he became the director in two, uh, the scientific director in 2019. His, so, so as you may have guessed and probably already know, uh, Bassem has this very original line of, of research aimed at trying to understand the, the role of deterministic and non-deterministic factors in, in brain development. And this uh, originality and the high quality of his work has, has led him to receive a number of awards, including um, an Einstein Fellowship. Uh, Alan Distinguished Investigator Award, and uh, this year, a couple of months ago, uh, the Roger Despersberg Prize. Um, little personal note on, on Bassam, we were actually we were actually chatting before uh, we went live, and uh, I had asked him. I tried to ask speakers for a little personal anecdote, and I I'm going to write tell you the one I wrote about him, the one he told me. But I think I realized also we both realized we had shared a near death experience together. So that'll be for later times. Uh, I'm, I, <laughs> I was the driver. I must admit, I was the driver for this near death experience. So <laughs> when we meet in, in, in 3D, um, we'll be both very happy to share this, um, this event. Uh, I, I think uh, Bassem's comment, though, is, is, is more interesting. And uh, let, let me read what, what I wrote. So during his, his early years as a student in back then uh, war-torn Beirut, Bassem had a passion for literature, in particular for poetry. Um, when the time came for him to make a choice, he rationalized that as a, he, quote unquote, as a scientist, I, I could still write poetry, but as a poet, I could not do science. Uh, so he chose to decipher the language in which nature writes her poem, and as he put it, 
There is poetry in biology in both its form and content, and the pursuit of that beauty is both rigorously rational and emotionally uplifting. So Bassem, uh, in this challenging time, I think we can all do with a little bit of emotional uplifting. We're counting on you. Uh, very happy to have you here, and uh, the, the screen is yours. Thank you, Denis. Uh, can you hear me? Is this working? For me, yes. Yeah, I guess okay. people would have complained if, if not. Thank you. Thank you so much for, um, for having me in, the, in this series. And what a great idea in, in this weird time, that, you know, getting us together, getting people from all over the world together. And I want to thank the, what, now 455 people who are here. Thank you so much <laughs> for coming to hear me. That's so cool. Um, and uh, what I'll do is I'll share with you. Um, so my lab's interested in, in how the brain. You want to share your screen already? Yeah, I'll, I'll do that in a second. Um, okay. How the brain develops. Um, we're interested in early events like neurogenesis, but we're also interested in the development of neural circuits and uh, how the development of neural circuits impacts uh, behavior. I'll start by sharing the screen here. Um, it's no, it's not that. Sorry, one second. It's being slow. Okay, it's not letting me do the sharing now. Hmm. I can uh, talk about the, the near death experience in the meantime. So I, I might have to like reload the whole thing because it's just not allowing me to do the screen sharing. So you don't have the little button on the top? Yeah, yeah, but if I click it, nothing's happening. It's you want to refresh wheel. like we did last yeah. time? You want to click the refresh That's thing? What I'm going to do. I'm going to do that. Sorry, everyone. Let's see. Okay, I yeah. think I'm back, right? Yes, you are. Okay, share screen. Um, okay. Yep. I'll Is go that in. working? Yeah, well done. Uh, okay. So I'll zoom in on the screen. Can you see the screen. presentation now? Yeah, it's all good, Basem. Okay, great. Okay. So, um, all right, so what I want to tell you about is a story of uh, how my individuality uh, might uh, emerge during development and how that translates into, into behavior. Um, so, so really, this is the problem, right? I mean, we know that the brain is extremely complicated and that um, connectivity in the brain uh, the connectivity of neural circuits is incredibly complex, uh, and yet somehow it works, and it works in a fairly robust way. Uh, in fact, so robust that it's, at least on average, pretty predictable, right? So, so this is the conundrum we all want to solve, and if we make things very, very simple, and we look at, you know, the simplest behavioral paradigm, which is innate responses to, to uh, environmental stimuli, um, then maybe there's a chance we can um, try to sort out how the complexity of the neural circuits in the brain might actually tell us something about how the brain works. Now, um, we'll start from the basic assumption that brain development is important for brain function. And of course, this is true in a trivial sense. So for instance, if we imagine some sort of a nucleus uh, uh, made of red and blue neurons that talk to green neuron, another nucleus that is made of green neurons and those mediate the response to a, whatever, a set of stimuli. Um, you can imagine that if uh, during brain development, the red and blue cells do not connect to the green cells, then you're not gonna get a response. So of course, in that sense, that the development of the brain is important for its function, but this is completely trivial. But there is a way in which this is somewhat less trivial in that the connectivity between 
uh, the red and blue neurons uh, to the green neurons may develop in many different ways. And it is completely non-trivial and actually totally not obvious how the responses in each of these hypothetical cases, and of course, hyper-simplified hypothetical cases, um, might differ from one another, and if so, why they would differ from one another. Um, so, therefore, understanding, in fact, the rules that allow the brain to develop the way it does would tell us something about what we expect for the brain to do, what, what constrains its capacity to respond, uh, you know, um, so wh where, what, what is allowed and what is constrained and how and why are the, the, these constraint, constraints there and how far do they go and why isn't everything possible and so on and so forth. So I would argue that just looking at the final structure of its activity is not sufficient to gain deep enough insight into how the system works. Understanding how the system builds itself is part and parcel of understanding not just how it works, but why it works the way it works. And so if we want to understand something about how neural circuits might govern behavior and how variation in neural circuit architecture might govern variation in behavior, one needs to understand what are the rules that uh, the brain utilizes in order to, to generate these neural circuits. And, uh, you know, work on many, many systems, the vertebrate retina included, but a lot really in Drosophila and C. elegans, uh, because they're very small, tractable, and so-called deterministic uh, systems, has led to a paradigm that dominated uh, the field for a long, long time. Um, in fact, it all started with Roger Sperry's work on chemoattractivity, and finally his sort of formulation of an extreme version of chemoattractivity, which said that every neuron knew exactly what it was doing because it was equipped with the right molecular codes um, to, to find its partner. Um, studies on the sensory system in Drosophila, both in the eye and in the, in the nose of the fly, which you see a schematic of here. So this would be, oh, um, my mouse is not moving. Anyway, doesn't matter. What is called the antenna here is the nose of the fly, and the antenna lobe is the part of the brain where the nose, uh, nose neurons project. And there's been this idea that as soon as cells are born, as neurons are born, they're equipped with a specific fate, a specific identity, which here is reflected as blue, green, and red, for example. Um, and the idea is that the, ident the molecular identity of the cell equips it with a, with, a, with a translation of the genetic code that makes its wiring inevitable. That is to say that the green neurons will always wire in the green part of the brain and the blue in the blue and the red in the red. And it's a simple consequence of the fact that they're born that way. So the moment the cell is specified is the moment it has all the information necessary to find its target which of course means that there is no developmental plasticity because there is a long time between the birth of the neuron and the time when it's finally synaptically connected to its target and that, that synaptic connection is active. Um, however, there is a, a paper that I think doesn't get uh, often enough uh, cited, which is work from a collaborative work from um, Lee Chun Luo's lab and Rachel Wilson's lab um, that sort of challenges this idea. So what was done in this experiment that you see schematized here and where you don't really need to worry about the details is you just took one figure from the paper to illustrate the idea. Um, what they did was they took a, a driver, uh, an enhancer co construct that labels about 15 interneurons in the brain in the olfactory part of the brain. And what they did is they made 161 single cell clones from this population of 15 neurons, which of course, if you calculate, means that they should see the same, on average, they should see the same neuron uh, a little over 10 times, right? So you take 15 cells and you see them in 161 times in 161 different animals. So that on average should give you the same cell back a little over 10 times, which means that in total, you should see 15 patterns, 15 patterns of anatomy and 15 patterns of electrophysiology. 
What, what they saw though is not 15 patterns, it's not 20 patterns, it's not 50 patterns. They made 161 different clones and they saw 161 different anatomies and 161 different physiologies. Which means that the same cell was slightly different in each brain. Yet, of course, we know that the totality of the circuit anatomy is highly robust. I mean, there's no one who has difficulty recognizing what part of the brain is what, or you know, where an axon from a retinal ganglion cell will end up in the superior colliculus, or etc. So, how can there be variability at single circuit, uh, at single neuron resolution? How can every cell be different in each organism, and yet the circuit overall highly stereotyped between organisms? Right. So what kinds of rules allow variation at single cell level and yet force stereotypy at the circuit level? And of course, that means that if every one of us had a slightly different version of any set of given circuits and yet kind of on average similar brains, then that begs the question of why and how are, are we, and therefore our brains, or I should say, our brains and therefore we, different as individuals and yet stereotyped as a population, right? I mean, no one's going to ever confuse, uh, you know, a butterfly with a honeybee, right? I mean, it's, it's pretty clear. And so why is that? Um, obviously, you know, species are species for a reason. They share a, a common genetic heritage. And so one can argue, and of course it is completely correct that individual differences in the genetic code in in your dna sequence makes in our dna sequences make us different right at the same time we know that uh, mosaic mosaicism a uh, genetic mosaicism apart we know that individuals who share uh, almost fully or even fully such as in parthenogenic uh, reproducing species their genetic uh, um, code their genetic sequence are not absolutely identical. So we know genetic differences are super important, but we know that they're not the whole story. When it comes to brain and behavior, we also know that neural circuits are modified by experience. Um, we don't know to what extent they're modified morphologically by experience. There's probably some level at which they are. They're mostly modified synaptically by experience, but that does modify behavior. And sometimes these experiences can be so strong and so important um, that they actually modify behavior for a very long time to come. I mean, you know, anyone who's experienced a trauma or an extremely unpleasant sensation in a given context does everything possible to avoid that context for the rest of their lives. And that, of course, means that they change their behavior. So, what may, you know, those, those two things combine to make us individuals. But like I said, both of those th things are controllable in, and we know from experiments on species where these things are controlled by definition because the individuals are genetically identical or because the organisms can be made to be genetically homogeneous and where the environment can be controlled, even the microenvironment can be controlled um, during development, we know that these individuals do not develop in exactly the same way and their brains do not either and therefore their behaviors end up not being absolutely identical. Now in the field of developmental biology, um, this is not a new idea. Um, the fact that development is subject to what is called um, stochastic developmental noise, which results in intrinsic developmental variation is, is kind of a common accepted thing. Um, it's, it's called that mostly because we don't understand how it happens. So we call it intrinsic variation and stochastic noise. Um, and one can argue to what extent it's stochastic and to what extent it's noise, but it's definitely there. And it cannot be uh, um, made to go away either by genetic homogeneity or by um, control of the microenvironment. The idea that this might be a contributor to the way the brain wires and therefore the way uh, behavioral variation might emerge is somewhat, uh, or was at least, uh, uh, a, a little bit less uh, ac accepted of an idea. And so we, and that's basically what the story I'm going to tell you about today uh, is. And so the, just by way of introduction, we're going to be using the, the fly brain, which you see to the right here, uh, 
parcelated into its different anatomical areas, just like uh, our brains are parcelated into different anatomical areas that are um, uh, that do different things, or at least privilege doing different things uh, as opposed to others. We know that you know in V1 mostly you do vision, you don't do olfaction, for example, and so on. And the same is true in the fly brain. And this part that you see uh, squared here or rectangled. Uh, in white here is the part of the fly brain that does vision. And the fly, and these are called the optic lobes, and the fly dedicates about half of its brain, if not more, for visual processing. So um, within the optic lobes, we're going to be studying a set of neurons, um, excuse me, called the dorsal cluster neurons, uh, and we're going to study them as a wiring model to try to understand how neural circuits develop and how uh, the rules that govern neural circuit development might allow population level stereotypy and yet individual variability or single cell uh, variability between, between individuals. Now the dorsal cluster neurons are a really cool model to, to address this question because they're sort of intrinsically highly variable. So uh, there are two clusters of cells on each side of the brain, as you can see here. Um, and the number of neurons can vary between 22 and 68. Um, these neurons will cross the brain from the left to the right and the right to the left. So they're contralateral, uh, higher order visual interneurons. And when they cross, they will make it all the way to the optic lobes. And in the optic lobes, they will make a choice between a distal target called the medulla um, and or abbreviated as ME, and a proximal target called the, uh, sorry, the lobule. Sorry, I went too fast there. Oops. Okay. We'll get back to that in a second. Now, in the medulla, this distal target, out of the 22 to 68 neurons, 6 to 23, depending on what brain you're looking at, will make this choice. Okay. And it turns out that this number, uh, there's no correlation between the number of axons that end up in the medulla and the number of neurons from which they originate, which tells us that this is not a simple sort of, you know, the fewer, the, you know, there's some ratio, constant ratio of cells that is going to go to the medulla. Um, and it's a fixed uh, sort of a Planck's constant type ratio. And you just multiply by the number of cells with this constant, you get the number of axons in the medulla. That's not the case. So how does it work then? How do, does an axon from one of those neurons make a choice between going distally or staying proximately, I, uh, proximally, i.e. how does it choose between the medulla and the lobby? One idea is maybe not all these axons actually cross the midline and go to the other side. Maybe some are ipsilateral and others are contralateral. Um, and we ruled that out by showing that actually every single one of these DCM cells I don't know why that went back, sorry about that. Every one of these single uh, DCN cells crosses the midline and it does so because it's able to ignore um, um, negative signals uh, from neighboring uh, neurons. Uh, and one of those negative signals is a protein called SLIT and its receptor is called ROBO. I think those of you who may have attended last week's talk uh, may have heard about ROBO. Um, and, uh, and so the, the axons, the DCN axons do not express robo, and so they can just cross the brain happily, get to the other side, they express a receptor for a protein called netrin, which is an attractive cue, and where the ax which is expressed in the optic lobes pretty broadly, and so these axons innervate the optic lobes. And we can show this because if we express robo in the DCNs, we make them all go contralaterally, as you can see on the bottom left. Uh, sorry, ipsilateral. So we can make them turn around at the level of slit expression and go back to the same side. So initially, one, you know, under normal conditions, all the cells go to the other side. You can make them all switch to one side. And therefore, the difference between the individual cells choosing to go to the medulla or the lobula has nothing to do with, the, with whether they cross uh, to the other side or not. Okay, so that's not the solution. So if they all cross to the other side, they must at some point make a choice between um, the pr proximal target shown in here in red, the lobula, and the distal target shown in blue, the medulla, okay? How is that choice made? And how can 
explaining that choice tell us something about um, the variation we observe in the wiring of the circuit. So how and when do these two DCN subpopulations emerge during development? Now, this is published, so I'm just going to give you the upshot of the story published a long time ago now. It turns out that the DCNs talk to each other via the notch pathway via a process called lateral inhibition. And the interesting thing about lateral inhibition is that it is an intrinsically stochastic process. It is genetically encoded to be stochastic, all right? So, and, and this is, as an interesting aside, we tend to often sort of mix when talking between genetic encoding and genetic determinism, but that's not the same thing. Something can be genetically encoded and yet not deterministic, as for example, the way the notch pathway works. It's completely genetically encoded. It's absolutely not environmental, and yet it is stochastic by definition. And so the way it works is um, cells talk to each other via this notch signaling pathway. And if you don't know this pathway, don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. And basically, if they have notch off, they go to the distal target. And if they have notch on, they go to the proximal target. And it turns out it doesn't matter which cell, and I'll give you, I'll show you an example of this in a moment, which cell is notch on, notch off, as long as one in every five or six cells on average is notch off and the others are notch on, you get this, um, uh, this effect. If you inactivate notch, you send more of the axons out towards the medulla. You can see this in notch loss of function panel. If you activate notch in all of the neurons, then none of them go to the medulla. So the levels of notch activity in each cell are necessary and sufficient to determine whether it's going to be a distal target axon or a proximal target axon. And because the process is stochastic, um, you get this sort of variation uh, from brain to brain. But how exactly and when exactly does this happen? When is the decision made and how does the decision actually translate into wiring? And um, Oh, sorry, before I get into that, let me just share with you what I mean by it's a stochastic process. Okay, this is frozen, there we go. Um, and, and how we sorted it out in a schematic. Again, this is all published, so I'm not gonna go through the data in great detail, but basically, the basic idea here is under wild type conditions, a few cells um, shown in green here will talk to one another and one of them will be the winner. And that winner will be the notch low cell, and it will go to the distal target. All the cells that are in direct touch with it will stay in the proximal target because they've lost until the next cell that has no interactions with that one red cell um, has to make a decision. And in this subset of cells, again, you get another axon and another axon, another axon. And so this explains why the pattern is sparse and why there are specific distances between axons in the medulla. You can demonstrate that that's what's going on by making individual cells mutant for notch. And in that case, it is that cell that you made mutant for notch that will win the competition and send its axon to the, to the distal target. And the other cells will retract in response. So you can sort of tweak the, the system where you can choose which cell wins that automatically makes all the other cells quote unquote losers. And so the rare cell that you made notch mutant will go to the medulla, all the others will be in the lobula, but the pattern, the overall pattern will actually be normal, will be within normal range. And that is the demonstration that it doesn't matter which cell goes to the medulla because it simply is compensated for by all the other cells. And you can show that's the case by basically making a bunch of neurons mutant for a notch so that they cannot interact with each other. They all think they're winners. And in that case, you send them all to the medulla. Okay? And so that's the demonstration that it's mutual inhibition at a local level that is making a cell by cell decision on a stochastic basis. So then the specificity of the wiring pattern, when we look at a hundred flies dissect their brains and say, well, there's on average that many axons and this is the spacing between them and so on. We look at something that looks highly stereotypical with some error bar in between that we tend to ignore for some reason. Well, 
it turns out that the error bar is what is telling us about how the process works. That is to say that what we would refer to as wiring specificity is not a priori encoded in the cells, in each cell individually. It's an emergent property of the cells interacting with one another, making stochastic decisions, and interacting as autonomous agents. Okay? So how do we get there? How do you go from, so this is the theory, right? You have notch and notch inhibits somehow the growth of the axon. And so you have to have notch low in order to go to the medulla. Okay, great. How does it really work? And Maeva Andriat Silavo in the lab, a, post, a very talented postdoc in the lab has been tackling this issue. So what I'm gonna show you now is some unpublished work from Maeva, where she used the technique developed in Robin Hiesinger's lab. Um, of intravital imaging. So what we basically do, what Maeva does, is she's able to image the brain of the developing fly during development, watch these axons grow out, um, and then keep that animal alive until it becomes an adult, and go back and match back every single axon that ended up making the distal target selection, where it was during development and at what moment it made the decision to grow or not to grow and what it looked like at that point. So that tells us what those, what do those axons that are notch low look like compared to the axons that are notch high. She can do this at the population level, but she can also do it at single, uh, single neuron level by making clones, which you see here. So what you see in the upper uh, panel is over time, the imaging of a single axon that actually is going to end up in the medulla. And then the lower panel, the imaging of a single axon that is not going to end up in the medulla. And what Maeva found is that the axons that will protrude past the initial target to the distal target, develop this bizarre looking bundle of fibers it's as if it's growing three or four parallel axons together. So you have a single initial shaft and a number of the short phylopodia decide that they're going to make sort of new axon shafts and develop these parallel fibers that are going up. No, they're not climbing. They're going forward towards the distal target. And once the distal target is reached, um, all of them will disappear and only one will remain. Of those, so it's like the cell itself creates competition within its own axon between multiple fibers. Whereas the axon that will not go to the distal target, you can see, remains explored, locally exploring, and does not develop these um, long bundles of uh, of parallel fibers that are. So now we have a pathway and we have a phenomenon. And the quest, so we have a decision maker and we have a phenomenon that is associated with that decision. Are they connected to one another? And the answer, uh, again, I'm, I'm sorry I'm giving you this a schematic in, in the interest of time, but basically the basic idea is it turns out that there's a critical period in which notch activity is necessary and sufficient to suppress bundle formation. So the neuron that has low notch will not have bundle formation suppressed and will make this bundle. Now this bundle is an actin rich bundle of very long parallel axons that come from the same axon, parallel fibers that come from the same axon. And they last just long enough to allow one microtubule to invade one of them. So it's like back hedging. You, you bifurcate or trifurcate or quadruple furcate your axon you make all of those actin-rich uh, fibers grow and one of them will be invaded by a microtubule. It doesn't matter which one because it is that one that turns out to be the final axon that will innervate the, the, the medulla. So now we have a translation from a stochastic decision at the sort of conceptual level, at the command and control level of the cell, of the nucleus, to the execution of this process also in a bet hedging scenario where you just allow things to grow and hope for the best. And of course, microtubules grow, that's what they do. And so they'll grow into one of those things and turn it into a distal targeting axon. If you activate notch early enough, you can suppress all of this. If you activate notch after the bundling has happened, you, there is no effect. So there's a critical period during which this decision has to be made and it gets translated in the way that I've just described. 
So that solves the problem of how the pattern arises during development. And that again tells us therefore that, pattern, that wiring specificity, at least in higher order circuits, is a problem of pattern formation. It does not require pre-configured address recognition codes. Those codes can actually emerge as cells interact with one another, interact with their environment, but also interact with themselves in a way as I just showed you uh, with this bifurcation. That the noise intrinsic to molecular processes, because all molecular processes are, are noisy and variable between cells, that this is not a problem that biology is trying to eliminate. This is actually a feature of the system. It's not a bug, it's a feature by which the algorithm that regulates brain development works to generate variation in the neural circuit, but because the different cells talk to each other and inhibit each other from doing the same thing, you get the sort of stereotypy at the, at the population level. And the sort of um, conceptual correlate of this, when we think about the fact that the brain is not designed by an engineer, it wasn't created by some supreme deity or whatever, it is an evolved entity from a pre-existing evolved entity one must, of course, put everything in the context of evolution because nothing makes sense in biology except in the light of evolution. Um, one begins to think about how these processes of variability and noise might actually contribute to the robustness of the development of the brain and allow further evolvability of a very robust uh, structure. And we can discuss that at length if you like afterwards, but you can also read about it in uh, um, uh, opinion papers that Robin Hiesinger and myself wrote, but many other colleagues as well, Ben DeBevoren and, and, and uh, many others, Mark Kirchner and many others have written about these, these ideas. Okay, so what do we have? We have a circuit that's different between different individuals. Um, and we have the potential therefore that the way the circuit is wired, if you think back at the initial diagram I showed you to argue that the importance of brain development to brain um, function is not just trivial, um, we can really begin to ask about how these subtle quote unquote variations in circuit wiring might actually com contribute to the emergence of personality traits. Uh, by which, of course, very operational, you know, down to earth definition the simple idea is a personality trait is something that defines you as an individual because it's invariant in you and dissimilar from the others, okay? So you are similar to yourself over time, but you're different from others, okay? So do fly show this? And if so, can we use the DCNs as a model to query this, this question? Now, to begin thinking about how might that might might be done, um, it turns out that there are clues in this in the classic literature of Drosophila visual neuroscience. One of the founding fathers of the field, um, Carl Georg Goetz, um, who worked on visual behavior in many insects, and his students then wrote uh, the following, or I'm paraphrasing, but basically wrote the following uh, insight. And I have to say that in going back and reading those papers, at least those of them that were written in English, because some of them were written in German, um, I couldn't really figure out exactly where that insight came from, exactly what behavioral elements in the behavior of an animal led them to this sort of strongly formulated conclusion. Um, but nonetheless, there it was, um, in which they suggested that when a fly is moving towards an object, so one of the things that a visual system does is react to motion in the environment or fixate on an object, right? So you, yeah, I mean, I think it's obvious. All visual systems have this innate capacity to either track motion or to do object fixation, orient yourself towards an object of interest. Um, and what Gutz and his colleagues hypothesized is that the ability of the fly to orient itself towards a fixed object depended somehow on, an, on a qualitative asymmetry in perception uh, between the left and the right eyes or the left and right sides of the visual system. They suggested that if there is asymmetry in this perception, 
as the fly turns or walks towards an object, if the object appears differently on one side than it on the other, um, then somehow that allows the animal to fit to or to put it better in the front of its visual field and to orient better towards it. Okay. Again, no idea why they said that, but that's what they said. And what's striking is that about a decade later. Um, Martin Heisenberg, a, another giant in, in uh, the genetics of behavior, particularly in, in the Drosophila visual field, was studying um, object orientation as independent from motor perception, from optomotor behavior. And he and Reinhard Wolf uh, hypothesized the existence of a higher order circuit that was a contralateral circuit that mediated crosstalk between the two visual systems that was required for object orientation. This was a completely hypothetical construct based on the fact that if they blinded motion vision, the flies could still orient towards an object, which suggested to them that object orientation did not require each eye separately, but a communication between the two eyes, okay? And for that communication, they said they drew, in fact, a hypothetical circuit that communicated the information from the left eye to the right eye. Now, let's take a second here and think about this together. The basic idea is if your perception of an object you're moving towards is asymmetric on the left than it is on the right, then your global perception of it is more accurate. Your global perception of its position relative to your motion is more accurate. That's one idea. The other idea is that motion, uh, sorry, is that object orientation requires a contralateral circuit that communicates between the two sides of the visual system. And of course, you know, it's fairly obvious that what the DCNs are, are a higher order contralateral circuit that communicates between the two visual systems of the fly and that is variable not only between every individual because, because of the way they wire, but also between the left right and right sides of the same individual, which of course variation between left and right is of course asymmetry. And so we started to look at whether um, indeed not only is the DCN circuit variable between brains, but within the same brain, if these are really autonomous decisions made by each cell on the left versus the right independently, then we should have differences on the left and the right. And that is exactly what we see. And if we now do transsynaptic tracing to ask whether the asymmetry in the wiring of the DCN axons results in the asymmetry of the wiring of the circuit, then the obvious answer, I guess predictable answer, but nonetheless nice to see answer, is that that is the case. So when the DCNs, for example, do not wire up to the dorsal medulla on the right, the dorsal medulla cells do not receive compensatory input by some branch coming from the ventral axons or whatever. They're really not connected. And that, of course, gives rise to asymmetry. So that now allows us to test, is it true that asymmetry is required for object orientation? And does the variation in this asymmetry produce variation in object orientation? And so now we need an assay for object orientation. And again, we go back to one of the classic experiments done by Goetz and his colleagues, which is called the Buridan paradigm or the dual stride fixation assay, in which you put a fly in the middle of an arena. You, that's what you see on the top left, schematized. Um, the bottom left is the real picture of one of those arena in the lab, and you ask, and you put that fly um, in a completely lit drum barrel in which the fly has at 180 degrees two dark stripes. And the fly cannot reach the dark stripes because the platform on which the fly is walking is surrounded by water and the flies can't swim. And they can't fly because we cut off their wings. So now what the fly does, it spends its time walking back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, trying to reach each of those stripes. And I'll show you an example of that in a video. You will see Garrett there, the postdoc who did all this work, um, dropping the fly on the arena. The fly tries to go to the first 
Stripe can goes to the other side, explores the possibility of crossing the ocean to get to the dark stripe. It can't, so it comes back, then changes its mind, goes back, tries again, and then says, okay, there's no way I'm gonna go back to the other stripe, and basically back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Yeah, they're, they are that dumb. So, <laughs> So basically what you can do is you can of course test the same fly over and over and over and over and over again, over days and weeks. And you can transform the path tracking of the fly into a heat map of its location. And if the fly were to walk randomly and differently on each day, then the heat map would fill the entire arena. But in fact, what the fly does on day one is what the fly does on day two, and on day three, and that is reflected in the heat map of its location over many days and, and weeks. And so here, for example, are the heat maps of three individual flies over a period of um, three days. So we test them, we rest them a day, we test them on the second day, we rest them again, and we test them again. And so this is what individual one looks to like, individual two, individual three, which you can say, which you can see has a complete preference for walking between the stripes on the left side. Individual four, who really avoids the middle and walks through mostly on the edges, and so on and so forth. And now you can ask, what is the correlation between the behavior on day one versus behavior on day three? And you can do that again two weeks or three weeks later. Um, and you will find that basically, individual flies are highly faithful to their own behavior. So this is an innate a trait, uh, essentially a personality trait of the fly. Um, its object orientation is a personality trait that is different between flies, but the same over time in the same fly. Is this heritable? The answer is no. So you can take two flies that like to walk down the middle and cross them to each other, and they will have all kinds of babies which you can see the distribution there in the histogram. And you can, they will have babies that walk like them right through the middle, but they will also have babies like individual three who really look like the neighbor's kids. Um, and so the walks all over the place. You can do the same experiment, taking flies that like to walk along the edges, mating them. Again, you will get a distribution with a mean. So the population mean is always the same and yet the individual variability doesn't differ. You can do that with strains of flies that have been inbred for 20 generations and it's the same story. You can take, you can do selection experiments in which for 10 consecutive generations, you will take the flies that like to walk through the center and breed them again and again and again and again. In, in every generation, you regenerate the entire variance of the population, just like you see here. So, it is not possible to breed out the variability and it is not possible to make sure that all your offspring inherit exactly your behavior, no matter, no matter how many generations you try to do that for. So now we have a circuit whose variation is a product of genetically encoded stochastic processes that is, ace, that is basically shows a range of asymmetries between left and right and across individuals. It's a visual circuit, it's a contralateral visual circuit, and we have an object orientation behavior that shows um, variability between individuals, that, that shows basically personality traits. So is there a correlation between the variation in anatomy and the variation in behavior? And the first question, and so to address that, the experiment, the heroic experiment that Garrett and his colleagues did was to record the behavior of about 300 flies, then dissect their brains, record the anatomy of the DCNs in each of these brains, many aspects of the anatomy, as you can see uh, here, and try to find correlations between individual behavioral parameters and individual anatomical parameters. And from this unbiased approach, what emerged is that when the DCN wiring is asymmetric, the flies walk a straight line between the two objects down the middle. And when the DCN wiring is symmetric, the flies walk all over the place. In diagonal lines, they meander. And so um, 
they have what we would call an object, a high object deviation index, whereas the asymmetric flies have a low object deviation index. Okay. But do we even know that the DCNs are required for this object orientation behavior? And the answer is yes. So here's the correlation between anatomy and behavior on the correlation plot on the lower left. Well, my lower left. Um, and uh, if you silence the activity in the DCN, so you let them develop just fine and you silence their uh, synaptic release, what happens is that all correlation between um, uh, behavior and anatomy completely disappear. Okay? So the DCNs are required for this behavior and their asymmetry correlates with the... You can predict how an animal will behave if you could see the DCN wiring you could also predict how asymmetric the DCN wiring is from the behavior of the, of the individual. Now, this is nice. The DCNs are required for the behavior. They're a, their asymmetry, which is the product of their sort of stochastic developmental processes, um, correlates with the, indiv the individuality of the behavior. Is, is it actually causal? And so what we did in these experiments is, in this particular experiment, is an experiment where we basically block the ability of the DCNs to talk to each other. And when we do that, we block notch signaling. And when we do that, we send the majority of the axons to the medulla on both sides. So we start to create a population in which the DCNs are much more symmetric on the left and the right. And when you do that, you totally create a shallower correlation plot, but you preserve the correlation. So the population as a whole shifts to more um, symmetric behavior, as you would predict, meaning that they meander all over the place. But the correlation between each individual and its behavior remains exactly the same as it is under control conditions, okay? So basically we can rewire the circuit to make it on average more symmetric and we can get the population to behave on average more symmetric. And yet every individual, when you dissect the brain, is still faithful to their wiring path. The behavior of each individual is still faithful to its wiring path. Now, recall that the initial insight of Goetz was the idea that perceptual asymmetry um, would create better object orientation. And so what we wanted to test is, you know, what we're suggesting here is it's the asymmetry of the DCNs that essentially regulates the quality of object orientation. The more asymmetric the DCNs are, the more asymmetric the information flow is between the two visual systems. And therefore the perception of the organism of this, you know, this asymmetry between the left and the right is a perceptual asymmetry that's regulated in the brain, not in the eyes. The eyes see the same thing. It's the brain that sends the information in an asymmetric way, allowing the animal to focus better. But if this were true, if the fundamental insight were true, the, the source of the asymmetry in perception shouldn't matter, right? And so to test this idea, um, we took individuals that are highly symmetric in their DCN pattern. And we can tell that because the individuals have um, uh, bad object orientation, they meander all over the place, and we blinded one eye in those individuals, right? With the idea that if you take individuals whose eyes and brains are symmetric and you, mo and you blind most of one eye, then you create visual asymmetry at the sensory level, not in the brain, but in the, in, in the outside. And what happens when you do that as you can see here, is that the same individual who initially was meandering all over the place between individual one in orange, meandering all over the place between the two stripes, now walks um, a much narrower path between the two stripes. They still have a highly angular motion, probably related to the fact that one eye is blind, but they actually walk a narrower path. The same is true for individual two, and you can see on the plot below the population plot in general, if you take the animals that have very high stripe deviation, object deviation indices, and you blind one eye, 
the overall population drops and becomes a better object orienting population. So that is it. That suggests that not only were both Goetz and Heisenberg right, but in fact, it so happens that for the last 20 years or so, my lab has been working on the neurons that were predicted to do this um, at least 30, 40 years ago. Okay, so I'll stop here and just conclude uh, with a few take home messages. The first is that as far as higher order circuits in the brain, at least as the DCNs as a model um, are concerned, we don't need to worry about how much every cell knows and how the genetic code works and in sort of a cascade of transcriptional events to tell every neuron exactly what it's gonna do and which other neuron exactly it's gonna wire to. Um, I don't think that model is plausible. I think it's quite wrong actually, but at least as far as these neurons um, are concerned, the specificity and is an emergent property of a pattern formation process um, that simply is filled with um, cell to cell interaction events within critical periods such that something has to happen at a given time point because once it happens, it creates a new state to whereby the neuron cannot go back to the previous state. That the noise that is intrinsic to every molecular process from transcription to splicing to RNA stability to translation to protein folding all of that, these are not bugs of the biological system. This is exactly what allows biology to not be physics and not be chemistry. That is to say that it's a messy, natural selection driven process. Um, so noise and stochasticity are features of the biological system and they are features because uh, these are not design problems. These are evolution problems that have to deal with unpredictable events um, in which certain individuals will propagate the species and others will, will not. And that this actually makes the development of the brain far more robust. Um, and there may be a price to pay in individual variation in that you have greater susceptibility to certain problems, the likelihood that any given individual may or may not end up being a prey or whatever, right? But it does make the process as a whole, the process of brain development and the control of behavior a much more robust process and therefore a much more evolvable process, which is at the end of the day, the only thing that natural selection really cares about. So obviously I didn't, I get to present this to all of you. I didn't do any of this work. Um, the work was done by an incredibly talented postdoc, uh, Garrett Linneweber with uh, joined later by uh, another super talented postdoc uh, Maeva Andrea Tsilavo that I showed you is doing all the live imaging on when uh, the decision is really made and a PhD student Suchitana Bias Dutta who is working on uh, how the DCNs uh, actually establish synaptic connectivity and what the link between um, axonal branching and uh, synaptic uh, active zone formation is and whether there's a feedback or a separate control or whatever and hope to tell you about that on some other occasion, maybe in 3D uh, in a few months. Um, so that's it. Uh, thank you for listening. Thanks to all the people who've trusted us over the years with, uh, with funding. Uh, and I'm more than happy to take uh, your questions. All right, Bassem, thank you very, very much. According to the now tradition, I'll be clapping physically, but if you go on your on your crowdcast screen, you'll see uh, comments from people and uh, and applauses. Uh, so yes, thanks a lot for driving us through this and in, in, in this particular last set of experiments, which I find are, are truly fascinating. So we have um, a couple of questions. Um, feel free to to continue vote, voting, also the students that are out there take also the, the opportunity to ask uh, questions in a relatively anonymous way. It's a good exercise. Um, so, so let's get started, Bassem. I have the questions in front of me. Um, first question um, by Isabel Caillé. What is the origin of the differences in notch levels between neurons? 
Right. So that's in a way the beauty of notch signaling. Um, can you hear me, Denis? Yes, it works. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, in a way, that's the beauty of notch signaling. You don't actually require initial differences um, in the sense of differences in levels of expression regulated by different enhancers or whatever between cells. Um, because of the way lateral inhibition works, um, whereby essentially, initially equivalent cells are um, express both delta and notch, so the ligand and the receptor, um, any small variation that is due to stochastic noise, uh, differences in uh, intracellular degradation of delta or notch, how much receptor versus ligand happens to be at that moment on the surface of the cell, these small differences get amplified because it turns out that as soon as you activate notch in one in cell A, notch represses delta expression. So as long as the levels are roughly equivalent, there is this sort of dynamic equilibrium. But as soon as one cell signals a little more to the other cell, the increased activation of notch in that cell suppresses delta, which allows it to signal less back, which means now you go from equivalent signaling to a slowly amplifying difference in signaling. And as soon as that is established, it's irreversible. Okay. And that's, you know, that's how we think it works. Okay, thank you. Um, next question: Do you do you think do you think inter-individual variability in behavior is truly higher in animals with bigger brains? And if so, which types of mechanisms would underlie this? I don't think so. I, I don't think it would be um, higher in bigger brains. I have not never seen evidence to convince me that, for instance, if you take C. elegans with 302 neurons um, that we are told are completely invariable between individuals. So there, it, you know, if there is some level of variation, it's, it's very, very small. Um, when you look on the other hand, on the spread of uh, the data points in any given behavior, mm -hmm. um, you compare a mouse experiment to a fly experiment to a C. elegans experiment, you don't really see uh, see differences. So I don't think that it's the size of the brain. I, I think there's a constraint on how much outside a, a certain distribution you can go and still be viable as an organism. Um, how far can your brain deviate from the mean of the species of the population and still give rise to an organism that is viable? And I think that is where the constraint is. And I think that that constraint is probably very, very similar across, uh, across animals. Now, what you could imagine on the other hand is that different behaviors could be differently variable. That is to say that for, in response to certain things, you know, where you really have a, a small number of cells um, in a labeled line sort of approach, you would really have most of the population around the mean, you would have a narrow distribution. Whereas where things, you know, if, 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 if it's a behavior that was not correlated directly to the way the species exploits its niche essential for survival, you might have greater flexibility in, in behavior. So in those types of, I think it's, it's harder to say whether sort of what we might call higher order cognitive, derived cognitive tasks that were not essential for the emergence or survival of the species, but then became sort of spandrels of the fact, like in us, the fact that we have this sort of big brain, you know, allows us to do things that were essential, not, not essential for us to emerge as a species or survive long enough to, to stay, um, that within those sort of derived abilities, maybe, maybe in cultural behaviors or whatever, maybe there's greater variation. Um, but within a given individual, would you say that uh, there's less variability if the circuit is uh, smaller, whatever that means, if there's less degrees of uh, freedom? I'm not convinced about that, to be honest. And, and the problem, of course, the problem with that is, you know, every, every behavior, even if the initial circuit is driven by a single cell, right, a single sensory neuron mm -hmm. that is receiving the information, the moment it gets into the CNS, that information starts to get distributive. And we know from record, electrophysiological recordings in any system, and many of you know 
a lot more about this than me. I mean, if you stimulate a given neuron, right, there is also a, a sort of a ripple effect in activity that is a function of the distance of connected neurons from that one neuron. That is to say that the more, the closer you are, the higher you're likely to be connected. And so the higher your, the higher your probability of response and the further you are, the, the lower your probability of response. So you, the moment you send information to the brain, you're creating ripples, which then create other ripples and other ripples. Mm -hmm. So even if the sensory pathway and at the other end, the motor pathway is extremely constrained and labeled, um, everything that happens in between, this hidden part that I showed in slide one, you know, makes me think that that it's, it, I mean, it's almost like the brain is evolved to be a, a random number generator and, and a variation generating machine. And that is get that gets constrained by, by sensory and motor and not the other mm -hmm. way around. It's not the mm -hmm. brain that constrains our behavior. It's the periphery that constrains our behavior in, in my, in my opinion. I mean, this is okay. wild speculation. Interesting. Uh, thank you. So next question, um, how does evolutionary selection pressure affect inter-individual viability? In other words, when condition gets harsh, quote unquote, uh, would that tend to decrease or increase viability, genetic, behavioral or otherwise? Right. I mean, that's a great question. And of course, it's not my expertise. I think a couple of weeks ago, there was a speaker from uh, the Karolinska who's really um, the expert on that. Um, but I can speculate a little bit, and we've done recently. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll rephrase the question. And so I, I don't know is the simple answer, right? The, the less simple answer is um, if a given genome, as I argued and I showed you data, in fact, um, if a given genome can generate multiple examples of, of a brain, right? So variation, I mean, the individual variability of the brain means that basically it's multiple examples of the same brain, right? Um, so multi variants of the same brain. That means that if one genotype can generate multiple phenotypes, it also means that the same phenotype for any given circuit can come from different genotypes, okay? Mm -hmm. So even though the type of variation I'm showing is non-heritable, and therefore you would say, well, if it's not heritable, how can it be selectable? It's true, any given, phenotype is not selectable. But a genotype that encodes a specific phenotype that selection acts upon is selectable. And since multiple genotypes can encode the same phenotype, even if selection is extremely high, selection pressure is extremely high, there will still be multiple genotypes that pass that bottleneck because they all contribute the same phenotype, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so in a way, even though you would predict if you had a one-to-one -one genotype to phenotype map, that high selection pressure would result in extremely low genetic diversity at the end of the bottleneck. In fact, what we're suggesting is it doesn't have to be that way because multiple genotypes can survive the same selection. And that would explain why, um, you know, there's no way you could get around genetic diversity and there's no way you can get around phenotypic diversity, no matter how you shift the selection pressure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. On a quantitative level, of course, depending on how strong the pressure is, you're going to have uh, some trade-offs. But that's really very far from my area of expertise, and I'd rather not speculate beyond what I've done so far. Okay, thank you. Um, how does nuclear notch transcription and signaling influence the distal axons in a very time-sensitive manner? Can you repeat that, please? Yeah. How does nuclear notch transcription and signaling influence the distal axons in a, such a time-sensitive oh. manner? Yes, that, that's great. So the fact that notch activity has a critical period actually may not require a magical solution. In fact, the uh, in response to the first question, I, I described how lateral inhibition works. And so basically, as soon as you create this differential, that's it. The different cells are different and are no longer responsive. It is not possible anymore to, to change them under wild type conditions. And so it turns out that, um, and we're still looking at that. We don't have all the answer, but it looks like notch activity in the nucleus uh, changes the regulation of genes uh, 
that are involved both in actin regulation and in microtubule uh, regulation. So there seems to be a feed forward onto RAC activity, RAC GTPase, and onto JNK signaling, both of which, um, you know, one is well known, well, both are major regulators of the cytoskeleton. So we think that as soon as the notch state in a given cell is established, um, the consequence is that there's going to be greater um, uh, actin depolymerization and repolymerization, allowing those phylopodia to go crazy and allowing therefore microtubule extension. And we think that junk activity might also, JNK activity might also stabilize growing microtubules through phosphorylation, um, indirect probably, um, to, to allow these axons to grow. So that's how we think it's translated. What is interesting is that even if we try to change the state of notch activity after the critical period, so if we impose high notch on all the cells after they've made the bundle, they no longer respond. And that's interesting, and we don't know why that is. It's possible that that might be because the downstream events have already kicked in, and you can't switch them back. It might also be that, of course, some epigenetic state has been imposed by Notch, where the nucleus, the gene expression program, is no longer responsive, and there's nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and those are interesting questions to explore further. All right. Next question. Uh, is there evolutionary pressure on the Buridan paradigm behavior? Is there any advantage for the fly to walk straight or not? Do you think that yeah, yeah, this is I mean, the same for flying flies? <laughs> um, sure. I mean, you know, it's a completely artificial system. And just because the DCNs seem to regulate object orientation in this particular artificial assay, uh, you know, I cannot guarantee you that that's what they are doing in the natural fly in nature. I, I have no mm -hmm. idea. It tells mm -hmm. us something about what the brain could do. Of course, it doesn't tell us about what the brain really does, right? Yeah. In real life. Now, does object orientation in and of itself matter? And the answer to that is obviously yes. I mean, a trivial answer to a trivial reason why it's yes is because it has survived selection in all visual species. So it must be important for something. And the other thing is, of course, if you cannot properly orient and alter your motion um, as an, you know, towards an object, in response to what else is happening in the world and response to your own motion, how can an animal ever ever reach a, a source of food, a potential mate? Uh, how can a goalkeeper, um, you know, track the movement of the ball and, and leap just in time to grab it? I mean, so, um, and we all know that without football, life doesn't mean anything. So, so yeah, there is evolutionary pressure. Okay, okay. Uh, we have a, a question by Shuba Tole. Hi, Shuba. Um, she, she's wondering whether um, the flies could actually be trained to um, walk straight, basically. Oh, fantastic. The, the truth. <laughs> that would mean this particular circuit can be overridden by other circuits. Yes, yes. So, there. I mean, I think there is good reason to say yes, because we know that innate preferences that have to do with other types of behaviors can be overridden by learning uh, to at least to one extent or the other. Um, we haven't done the experiment yet. Uh, we're gearing up to do exactly that, which is to see if we can use associative learning conditions. So associative conditioning uh, to um, trick the flies to want to walk more straight and mm -hmm. see what that implies to what other circuits might be implied in this and what plas the plasticity mechanisms um, might be. But at the moment, it's just an idea and a project we have. Uh, mm -hmm. we, haven't, uh, we don't have any answers to that. Can, can you train them to stay at home? <laughs> Well, yeah, and unfortunately, we can find them by definition. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, All right. Maybe related to that, does neuronal activity play any role in the wiring of, of, of this circuit? There's a few questions on the role of activity. Yeah, we haven't seen any evidence that activity is required for any aspect of uh, the uh, morphological aspects of wiring that I described. Um, even the number of uh, pre, uh, presynaptic axon branches seem to be normal in the absence of synaptic release. Uh, 
so if we use tetanus toxin, for instance, a genetically mm -hmm. encoded tetanus toxin light chain, we still get, you know, a normal pattern of uh, development. Um, but we we don't know whether later on, if you silence activity, whether there's going to be some sort of a degradation. I assume there could be a degradation. But the developmental aspects, at least at the resolution that we have looked so far, do not seem to be in, uh, to require. Okay. Uh, when, what happens when two or more distal axons target the same cell during branching? Uh, what determines the winner in this case? Two distal axons target the same cell. Yeah, I guess it relates to, I guess, I imagine the, the question refers to the resolution in terms of uh, axonal specificity and competition. Like, would they compete for a region or a single neuron or maybe even a subcellular compartment? Um, we So, we don't know for sure yet. So, what Sushitana... Uh, uh, Maeva and Garrett in the lab are doing, and so Shatana mainly leading this effort, is to map uh, at uh, a light microscope level uh, using this technique called TransTango, which I, uh, which I, um, I briefly showed you these red-green asymmetry, right? So this technique allows us to label all the putative postsynaptic cells. And then we can do that very sparsely across tens or hundreds of individuals to get a survey of all the postsynaptic DCN cells. Um, and um, so we're doing that at the moment. Each uh, DCN axon has pretty pretty long uh, 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 sideway you know, presynaptic branches. And so we don't think that every axon connects only to a single cell. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it looks like every cell type or a significant number of known cell types in the medulla get contacted by DCNs, suggesting that they are not really that discriminatory um, in the relay. It looks like they're relaying global information from the left side to the right side to a plethora of uh, medulla subtype neurons, which would then relay them back into uh, motor control centers um, optomotor centers and eventually motor control centers. We don't think there's that much specificity at that level, but we're not okay. sure. Uh, Garrett is doing EM level map uh, tracing uh, with the colleagues at Genelia, and we will see in a couple of years what the answer is. Okay, perhaps also related to that, uh, how do you come down on the common wisdom, quote unquote wisdom, that invertebrate neural circuitry is much more dis deterministic than invertebrates? I guess it's a little bit different than the question before. It's not about whether, you know, small brains imply stereotypic behavior, but um, yeah. whether the circuitry itself is more determined. I, th I think, you know, honestly, I, I mean, uh, maybe I will be controversial here, but I don't care. Uh, <laughs> um, Honestly, it's recorded I, forever on YouTube. Yeah, but, that's fine. I, yeah, I mean, it's an, I, my opinion is written and is recorded in writing already, so it doesn't. <laughs> no, I, I honestly don't understand the the insistence on on this model. Um, I don't understand the logic that oh, you know, because they're smaller, they're more deterministic. Because the idea that something is deterministic or not, right? In principle. I mean, if it's deterministic, then it's in the code that creates it. It's not in the thing itself, right? What's deterministic is the process that um, generates the, the phenomenon. So why should it have to do with how big the animal is going to end up being? This doesn't make sense. I mean, mm -hmm. either the genetic code and the way the genetic code is transcribed and translated are, are deterministic processes or they're not. I would suggest that this question, right? If, if we imagine, you know, at the beginning of life, there was a choice between making life deterministic and making life probabilistic, that would have been settled way back then. <laughs> and from that point, from that moment on, I mean, how is it, if, if we all have a common origin, how is it possible that, you know, some branches of life went with a deterministic path and the other branches of life went with the undeterministic path. And that has something to do with how big the animals ended up being. Does this mean an elephant 
uh, heart develops less deterministically than the heart of a mouse. I mean, so there is something irrational about the idea in my in my view. So I well, couldn't it relate to the number, for example, of cell divisions involved? Like if you have a probability of something happening, the more ah, time that particular event happens, ah, then it happens, right? So different. bigger brains is more divisions. But that's different. That means that the outcome of the process may be more or less constrained. It doesn't mean that the process... So if we mm -hmm. say the number of cell divisions, you know, is noisy and probabilistic, then the number of cell divisions is noisy and probabilistic. Whether that number is one or 100 doesn't change the fundamentals of the process. What is different is if the progenitor, let's take a fly neuroblast and a, a human radial glial cell, okay? They will divide a different number of times. So of course the outcome of this is more likely to be variable in a human uh, the number of progeny that a human rated glia will generate, the spread, is likely to be higher in number than the spread that a neuroblast will generate. That doesn't mean that the fundamentals of the process of regulation of cell division is deterministic in the fly and non-deterministic mm -hmm. in the human. No. That's absurd. Agree. That doesn't make yeah. sense to me. Yeah. I understand why there was this drive to suggest that brain wiring is deterministic because when people were looking at relatively low resolution, they could see that the same axons wired to the same places, et cetera, et cetera, all the time. And so if the outcome is quote unquote invariable, then the process underlying the outcome must be deterministic. My answer to that is one, when we look at higher resolution, we see that the outcome is not invariable. And two, so there's a data answer to that question, suggesting that the idea is in and of itself not correct. But there's also a logic to it, which is very simple. It's um, non-deterministic processes can generate both variable and invariable outcomes. If a cell divides stochastically, but only once, it will always make two cells, 100% of the time. Okay, the outcome is invariable, the process is probabilistic. So, whereas deterministic processes, except for a couple of mathematical theor uh, mathematically theoretical possible things, like um, class four automata, but anyway, um, deterministic processes in principle can only generate invariable outcomes. So if the outcomes are variable, how can the processes be deterministic? Mm -hmm. To me, it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we have a question uh, from Alain Chedotal. Do you think such a process might contribute to handedness in humans? By the way, Alain, I, th I hope you appreciate the, the haircut. <laughs> Your haircut, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. He didn't comment on yours so far. Yeah, yeah. So handedness. You think there's stochasticity and handedness in, in humans? I mean, why not? It's an asymmetry, right? It, it's possible. I, I have no idea. Um, there, there is also something, I mean, that's one possibility. There is something very, very interesting that we're working on with a colleague here in Paris called Mark Wexler, who actually shows people um, uh, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, um, Noisy, noisy, not noisy patterns, um, ambiguous patterns. Mm. So in the visual system of humans, he show, you, you can show people ambiguous motion, dots moving on a screen, totally ambiguous, right? And actually the perception of motion is your perception. The dots are not actually moving, they're appearing and disappearing. Yep. And, and what's interesting is they're appearing and disappearing in the same way, but every individual has a different bias to report how they see that motion. Yeah. Now, if you test the yeah, same- Maybe somebody online could, could pull out the link to that. It's a classical experiment, yeah. The direction of the, the movements of the dots. And if you now query the same individual multiple times, and people actually did in, in I don't know the year, there's a PNAS paper that I recently saw where they looked at about, a, I forget how many people, and with the exception of three over a one year period, with the exception of three individuals, an old classic paper, um, 
people over coming back three months later repeated uh, reported exactly the same biases in uh, so not only is it in handedness might also be in visual perception just like in, in the flight and so what we're trying to do is maybe develop a way in which we can do mri while these people are looking at these screens and see if we see mm -hmm. activities in the brain or cool whatever. we're dreaming <laughs> A little bit of a technical question. Are you concerned that variability in the DCN cell or axon number might instead reflect variability in the genetic line slash marker used to label them? Oh, I mean, yes. So we've gotten that question uh, a million times. So basically, we use at least three different versions of this that are uh, either the enhancer or simply a knock-in of the GAL4 into the locus or the enhancer... Uh, um, um, as a transgene in a different locus, and we can breed them to each other. And not only is the variation the same, but also the patterns of, in any given individual between different transgenes and different constructs are the same. So I think it's highly unlikely that the, the second thing that makes it unlikely is if when we change, as I told you, I didn't show you all the experiments we did to changing the wiring of the circuit, we can make it more symmetric or more asymmetric by our tools, and yet the behavior reflects what our tools predict. Mm -hmm. And of course, when so it, it kind of makes it hard to think that our tools are biased, and yet uh, the behavior is regulated by our tools. I mean, that's I think. Okay. Um, maybe something about metaplasticity in a way is the extent of developmental noise and stochasticity within a population an involvable inheritable trait huh uh i think one should ask mark kirchner about this he has elaborate ideas on this um i i don't know again is the easy is the easy answer um but i would guess so because i think that you can you have to constrain it, right? Um, and I would suggest that at least some, so I'm gonna go out on a limb here. Um, I would suggest that at least some neurodevelopmental disorders, I think you and I, Denis, had a Twitter, a brief, very brief Twitter thing. You tweeted a paper and we discussed about um, the, uh, the, the possibility that certain neurodevelopmental disorders may actually mm -hmm. be mutations in genes that control excessive noise. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the simple things you can think about is if you have a chaperone that regulates the fact that the majority of proteins made in a cell should really fall pretty much normally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you now reduce the activity of the chaperone, you can imagine that now you sort of expose all the possible range of random protein folding, which would reduce the amount of protein that folds properly, which would result in defects in development. So that would suggest that, that genes evolve that regulate noise, that, that, that control noise, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in a way you evolve mechanisms that are stochastic in their nature, but you limit how noisy they can be so that the curve looks like a normal distribution and doesn't sort of flatten out to to something incompatible with life that would be my guess yeah 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 okay i'm scrolling through the um, i'm scrolling through the questions there's quite a few but maybe we need to to wrap up a little bit let me you can also look at them you can also handpick them yourself too if you click on ask a question uh, but let me see. I've, I've sorted some out because they overlap with some that have um, already been answered to. There's a, quite a few questions on asymmetry, left-right asymmetry, but I think you elaborated quite a bit on that. Um, do you think that once the bundle is made, targeting of the medulla is dependent on guidance molecules or not? Um, yeah, it almost certainly is. So you can you can reduce. I mean, we haven't done it in a temporally specific way, but if you go back to uh, Srana et al. Uh, in 2006, which is one of the first papers where we started describing how the axons in the medulla behave, uh, and uh, the the paper I quoted about crossing the midline and getting into the 
the optic lobes. Um, so it looks like uh, a certain level of non-canonical wind activity uh, and uh, a certain level of frazzled activity, so netrin dependent, presumably, um, are important for the axons to either be attracted to the medulla to begin with or to at least stay in it. And we haven't really looked at... So one could, you know, look in a in a reduced netrin or reduced wind five background as to how those bundles look. That's that's a great idea. Thank you for that idea. I, I don't know if Maeva is listening, but if if she is, maybe that's a cool experiment to try. <laughs> okay, I think we're we're reaching the end um, uh, of our allotted time. Uh, those of you who want to directly ask questions to to Bassem, I'm sure he'll be happy to to answer them at some time or another. Uh, so at this stage, what I really want to do is thank you again, Basen. It was, it was a lot of fun having you in. Uh, very inspiring well, and answer, interesting discussion. How do I answer the remaining? There are questions that are remaining, and then there are questions within the chat box or something. Well, uh, in principle, there shouldn't be questions in the chat box. Um, okay. so I, 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 I would suggest people that have pressing questions that have not been answered to send you a mail. Probably that's the simplest. Okay. And, uh, cool. Yeah. And um, and Bassem promises to to answer by the time we're allowed to wander freely in the streets of our cities. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I, so is my email shared, or should I put it here, or what do you suggest? Well, people can look it up, I guess, if, 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 yeah. it's, if it's urgent, they can look for corresponding authors. Um, before we uh, say goodbye, I want to uh, advertise uh, next week's uh, talk. So same time, same place, 5 p.m. Uh, in front of your computer on Thursday. It'll be uh, Silvia Capello from the MPI in Munich who will be telling us, her title is Following Neural Trajectories. And she'll be telling us uh, a bit about disease, I guess, and also normal development, perhaps at the interface of, of what uh, Bassam just uh, alluded to in terms of pathological consequences of, of developmental processes. So looking forward to that. People, please do, do come. Uh, until then, uh, stay safe. All the best and uh, hope, to, hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, Denis. Bye.